Hi, I'm Jared Gardner. Today we're going to talk about cutaneous horns. These are really interesting lesions that uh, occur sometimes on the skin and are pretty dramatic clinically. Here's a very subtle example. This is a dorsal hand of an older man and you can see there's a lot of sun damage. As you can tell by the mottled kind of uh, pale and brown blotchy uh, area. There's a lot of solar lentigos uh, in there and also these pink kind of raised scaly lesions, some of which the scale is starting to build up. That scale is made of uh, keratin. And so these are these are actinic keratoses here. And sometimes the, the scale builds up and gets kind of thick. And what we call this is a cutaneous horn. Now this may not seem too dramatic, but they can actually start to rise above the surface of the skin. Here um, on the scalp of an elderly patient, you can really see that it's starting to grow and look like a little horn. Here's an example that's uh, larger and more dramatic, and this is from the lip. And th these images I'm using here, these are all uh, Creative Commons uh, images that can be freely used, and I'm gonna have links to the original sources down in the video description uh, below. And uh, I've modified a few of them by cropping, but otherwise these are um, the original images. And so this is an example here, you know, of how large these can get. They can really stick up above the surface. The problem with these is that it's hard to know what is actually causing the horn. The horn is made from buildup of keratin, and that can be due to a variety of epidermal lesions, usually keratinocyte uh, overgrowth. The three most common entities that cause cutaneous horns are Veruca vulgaris, warts, um, actinic keratosis, and then squamous cell carcinoma. And occasionally seborrheic keratoses can, can do it also, but usually it's either wart, actinic keratosis, or squamous cell carcinoma. Here's an example on the ear, and you can see there are several uh, lesions, and they really are sticking up. You can see kind of a pink base here, and the, uh, the epidermal cells that are causing the process to grow are probably right underneath the base there. And really, it's very difficult to tell apart, uh, reliably tell apart what the actual cause of the horn is unless you biopsy the lesion and have a pathologist look at it under the microscope. So we can, we can see the cells that are actually causing the horn to grow. Here's a much more dramatic example from the top of the helix, and you can really see the horn growing out here from the base. And here's one, the picture's a little blurry, but I think this is the chest below the shoulder here, and this is a huge horn uh, growing out from an underlying lesion there. So they can get quite large and really start to curve and, and uh, grow over time. And you know, horns uh, in nature, when animals have horns, they're made of uh, well, like rhinoceros horn is actually made entirely of keratin, that's my understanding. Uh, many other animals that have horns actually have a bone uh, underneath the horn, but then the outer surface of the horn is covered with a dense layer of keratin. So it's similar to what's happening here in the skin in humans. When these horns happen, they're made of dense keratin. And my, one of my former fellows liked to point out that, that horns have keratin, but antlers actually are made entirely of bone. So horns and antlers are different things. I'm not an expert on uh, animal biology or zoology, but that's what, that's what I've been told. And here's another really dramatic example. This one's very dark in color, but growing out of the, um, the posterior aspect of the helix here, a very large horn. So they can get uh, large and dramatic sometimes. Now let's look at the microscopic appearance of cutaneous horns, okay? Here is, I, don't, I can't go any lower power than this. That's the thing with horns, they're so big sometimes, but look, it just keeps going and going and going. It's like a tower of keratin all the way up from the epidermis down below. And remember, these are thick, huge piles of dense keratin, usually parakeratin with the nuclei still intact, and they are being produced by proliferating keratinocytes in the epidermis. Now, what type of keratinocytes and what type of lesion? We have to look at the keratinocytes at the base to see. So if the shave biopsy, and sometimes this happens, if it's not done deep enough, you might only have the cutaneous horn and no epidermis. You cannot make a reliable diagnosis. What I'll say then is dense, compact keratin. This could represent a, a horn, but I don't see the epidermis underneath and I, I can't tell what kind of lesion it is. Uh, I try to say it a little bit more eloquently than that, I guess, but basically I say that I can't see the epidermis and that if, a, if a, uh, an additional biopsy would be needed that's deeper into the skin for me to make any sort of diagnosis here. Um, and here, sometimes I also see this. Look down in the left corner. You can see a tiny little, uh, tiny little tip of intact epidermis here, and it looks like the, the papillary kind of finger-like structure on, in a wart. So in a case like this, I would suspect that I'm dealing with a wart. For one thing, I can see little papillae, 
And two, I can also see that each of these, uh, there's like these spires, these really tall needle shaped, you know, like a church steeple, a really tall stack of, of a keratin. And they're kind of, you can tell they're multiple of them and they have space in between them. And that's analogous to what we see down here. Each of these papillae, these finger like structures makes a spire of parakeratin on its surface. That's a classic feature of warts. So if I had this corneal layer up here, I could suspect it's a wart, but that said, I've seen many squamous cell carcinomas that look very much like a wart on the surface and down in the base of the lesion are clearly malignant and infiltrative and invasive. So that I see all the time. So I'm really cautious about uh, making a bold diagnosis of a wart on sun damaged uh, skin, particularly like the dorsal hand or the forearm of older people, if I cannot see the base of the lesion, and definitely if I can't see the epidermis. So that's my approach. But in this case, we have a nice example. Yeah, there's a tiny bit that's transected here, but I really can see the vast majority of this lesion, and it looks totally classic for a wart. Okay, it's got the papillomatous surface, it's got the dilated vessels in the dermal papillae, so these finger-like projections, the papillomatous surface. Sorry, let me get in focus there. Then in the dermal papillae underlying those, dilated capillaries, a really common finding. There's hypergranulosis. The granular layer is very thick, and it tends to get really dark purple and kind of blocky or chunky looking uh, granules rather than the fine granules of normal skin the granules in a veruca tend to get really big and blobby uh, or coalescing the granules kind of uh, hook up together and become a lot bigger and uh, more globular than in normal skin all right sometimes you'll see uh, coilocytes but oftentimes you do not and then over here at the edge, like see those cells are probably coilocytes right here. They've got a large nucleus and a little halo or a vacuole of clear space around the nucleus. Again, note that nice hypergranulosis. Look over here at the edge from low power and you see one of the most helpful features, in my opinion, in towing. The reedy ridges here, instead of going straight down, they bend and point or, or tow inward towards the middle of the lesion. And if we go to the other side of the wart, we see the same thing. We see these reedy that are pushing down and starting to bend and push inward towards the middle of the wart. So those are great features for a Veruca vulgaris. And this is a Veruca that's producing a thick, huge cutaneous horn. And uh, one other thing, I should probably make a video, I guess, one day on, on Veruca, but on sun damaged skin, you sometimes can see enlargement of the keratinocytes and even some cytologic atypia in Veruca, particularly if they're inflamed. So it can be challenging sometimes to tell Veruca apart from a squame, particularly if it's transected right through the middle of the epidermis. In this case, I can see the tips of most of the reedy down here. And really, there's only this tiny area that I can, I, it'd be hard to imagine how that would go much deeper. So in a case like this where I can see almost the entire lesion, there's no severe atypia, it looks very much like a wart in every other way, I feel confident making a diagnosis of Veruca vulgaris here, and in this case, one with a cutaneous horn. Let's look at a few additional horns. Oh, that's a beautiful one. Look at that. It's like a zebra stripe or tiger stripe. I really like seeing uh, horns. I think the keratin is, is so beautiful microscopically. And for as um, um, unlovely as these lesions look clinically, they look quite beautiful under the microscope. So that one's really incredible because you've got alternating layers of compact orthokeratin in this case, and then loose flaky orthokeratin. And you also have some little spires of parakeratosis, and again, those are coming right off the finger-like papillomatous surface of this Veruca vulgaris. And this is a nice example of a Veruca that's making a horn. Really, just quite amazing. And it's in very sun-damaged skin, but we can see the entire base of the lesion here. Very pretty example. Now here's another horn, and again, from low power, you can see it's this huge mountain uh, or cone of keratin building way, way up above the skin surface. You could easily imagine that this looked like the horn that I showed you at the start of this video on the patient's skin surface, right? But again, there's no way to know what's going on underneath here in the epidermis, what's, what's growing this horn until we look at it microscopically. And this is a really nice example, I think of an actinic keratosis that's making a horn. And here you can see normal skin out to the side. Well, normal except for the massive amount of sun damage, the solar elastosis down here. 
But this is a relatively normal epidermis. Maybe it's a touch thick and granular layer due to scratching, so like lichenification or lichen simplex chronicus, which you often see around horns or around any keratotic lesion because patients tend to pick at and rub at their lesions, whether it's an AK, a squame, a seborrheic keratosis, a wart. People uh, often will rub or pick at their lesion, and so they'll often get thickening of the skin and hypergranulosis around the edge of any keratotic lesion in my experience. Here you can see this abrupt transition from the relatively normal epidermis here to much larger pink cells. The keratinocytes have much expanded, kind of what we call glassy, this, this pink, dense looking cytoplasm. And also if you look down at the basal layer, you can see there are some large atypical keratinocytes down towards the basal layer. And the basal layer isn't nicely organized, it's kind of uh, jumbled and disorganized and thickened compared to compare that without here, where we've got this nice layer, single layer of cuboidal basaloid cells at the basal layer, and then a transition into the spinous layer and the granular layer and the corneum. And over here, it's just very disorganized in here, okay? But if you go up, you still see maturation into flat squamous cells at the surface, okay? So this is an actinic keratosis, and when these actinic keratoses get really thick like this, uh, I usually like to use the word hypertrophic actinic keratosis, um, all right? And uh, although, in, in all honesty, the cells are hypertrophic, they're getting bigger, but there's also hyperplasia of cells, too, increase in number, and dysplasia, atypical, um, potentially pre-malignant change. So we actually have a lot of things here, but clinically, these are thick lesions, and the reason they get biopsied, even when they don't have a horn over them, is because the, the concern, because they're thicker and more firm to, to touch, um, is that it could potentially be a squamous cell carcinoma. So I tend to see these biopsied quite often. And you can see a thick layer of confluent parakeratosis over the top. And again, anytime the epidermis starts proliferating quickly, you don't have time for the granular layer to develop and the nuclei don't get wiped out and dissolved and they get retained in the corneal layer. So hypogranulosis, parakeratosis, those two things go hand in hand, and they're usually a sign that the epidermis is turning over more rapidly, whether that's because of actinic keratosis, squamous cell carcinoma in situ, psoriasis, the reason it doesn't matter that when you see para and you see loss of granular layer, it means the epidermis is growing quickly usually. All right, and um, again, this is atypical and jumbled, but still nicely mature. It's a beautiful example of actinic keratosis here, atypical jumbled cells along the basal layer, maturing into relatively normal, aside from the parakeratin, but, but clearly not cytologically malignant cells at the top. You definitely have a maturation from more atypical down here to more normal um, and conventional looking uh, cells that are starting to flatten out and get small up towards the top. Okay, so I would call this a hypertrophic actinic keratosis, and again, it's making a mountain of keratin a horn. And while we're looking here, look at this little area that seems to be kind of spared by the horn. We have this, this little swirly, spirally tube coming here. That's an acrosyringium, the opening of a sweat duct, an acrine sweat duct, where it uh, empties sweat out onto the skin surface. These are usually seen best in the corneal layer of acral skin on the palms or soles, but you can see them in other places. Anytime the corneal layer gets thick, like in this horn, it's basically starting to look kind of more like acral um, skin. It's getting thicker, and so you can see these acrosyringia. And the fact that the acrosyringium is spared and not covered by that same layer of parakeratosis, um, that's a good sign for actinic keratosis as opposed to squamous cell carcinoma. You can see the same thing over hair follicles too. Now, you don't actually see the sweat duct here, and that's because of the three-dimensional nature of skin. If we cut deeper into the tissue, the duct is probably just a little bit deeper into this tissue section. We just can't see it in the little thin slice that we have. But we can see the evidence of it by its uh, outflow tract here, the acrosyringium um, spiraling through the horn overlying this uh, this. Uh, uh, hypertrophic actinic keratosis. Real nice example of that. And finally, here's another horn, and it's growing over a very atypical keratinocytic lesion. These cells have marked nuclear atypia. They've got tons of, this is a great example of glassy cytoplasm. It's hard to explain what glassy cytoplasm means, but when someone shows it to you, that's how you can appreciate it. It's abundant, dense, pink cytoplasm, and, it, and at least in many types of squamous cell carcinomas, we tend to see this. 
where they're the nuclei are atypical, but the NC ratio is actually decreased. It's actually lower the nuclear cytoplasmic ratio because we have so much of this cytoplasm. In a lot of cancers, we want to have a high NC ratio to make a diagnosis of malignancy, but in squam, the rules are a little bit different. And again, I'll address that in another video at some point in the future. But here we have obvious atypia. We've got glassy cytoplasm. You can see parakeratin being produced and going up, 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 up to make a horn over top. And then look underneath this, we have uh, the tumor is starting to trickle out and invade into the dermis and we can see that there's a desmoplastic stromal reaction in the dermis to the tumor. So it's beginning to invade there and here's some more invasion here. This is kind of expanding and getting glassy. So a squamous cell carcinoma making a cutaneous horn. Great example of that. This is why these lesions get biopsy, just to make sure that you're not missing a uh, cancer underneath. And then here's one other example. Look at that horn. It's so huge. It's, it's just so tall and thin. It always amazes me how a patient would leave this and not pick it away, because I imagine if that were on my skin, I would probably pick at it and, and, uh, until it fell off. So maybe that's too much information, but I think I, we in Dermpath, sometimes we like to, to be a little judgy and say, oh, that patient's been scratching or picking at their skin. But we know full well that most of us, if we had something like this on our skin, we would be scratching or picking at it as well. And so here's an example, marked cytologic atypia there. Can't really see the base of this lesion, but it's very atypical. So this is one, when you see ones like that, you could wonder, is it an actinic keratosis or a squame? And it can be hard when they're transected and you can't see the base. But here you can see that the atypia is more abundant and is really pushing down. So I think this is one that I would probably regard as a squamous cell carcinoma that's at least in situ. Some people might argue and say this could be an actinic keratosis, but with this broad pushing area here that's transected, I would wanna make sure that this lesion had been at least uh, curataged or that it was treated somehow because I would be worried that we might actually have invasion underneath there. So when they're transected like this, and this is clearly a nice big biopsy, right? They got under the entire horn and got underneath most of the lesion well into the dermis, but sometimes these keratinocytic lesions um, uh, will push down deeply and we can't see the base even with a, uh, an experienced dermatologist doing a nice, uh, a nice deep biopsy for us, sometimes we still can't see the base. So that can be problematic. But in cases like this, you definitely could wonder either between actinic keratosis and squamous cell carcinoma. And I'd like to pretend that I never have that problem anymore now that I'm a, a board certified dermatopathologist and I've been in practice six years. I struggle with this very scenario on a basically daily basis still. I've kind of learned some ways to deal with this. And again, I'll, I'll deal with that in another video and talk about it. But uh, sometimes it's just almost impossible to decide if something's an AK or an invasive squam or a squam in situ when the lesion's transected. But in any case, the main point of this video is to see the amazing, fascinating beauty of the cutaneous horn and the three main lesions that it grows from, Veruca vulgaris, Seberi, I'm sorry, uh, squamous cell carcinoma and uh, actinic keratosis. And I, I meant to say also that you can sometimes see horns over seborrheic keratosis. Um, it's much less common. Uh, and usually it's kind of dense orthokeratin when that happens. I don't actually have an example to show you, but it does happen from time to time. So a seborrheic keratosis is a less common cause of a horn. But the most common ones are verruca, actinic keratosis, and squamous cell carcinoma. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, presentation on cutaneous horns. And uh, if you liked it, please click the like button down below and subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet. And feel free to leave any comments or questions in the comment section below. Thank you so much for watching.